All right, thank you, Alex. Um, all right, so here's a bit of the Natchez Trace, uh, one of these famous hollow ways that people often think of when they think of old roads, um, not in here in the U.S. as well as in Europe and, and other parts of the world. And these are largely the result of um, wheeled vehicles uh, that create these kind of deeply entrenched uh, roads. And we see a bit of that along the Federal Road, but it's uh, uh, a late development. And what I want to look at, uh, not just at the Federal Road, but at all early roads, um, you know, you know, so cover all the early roads uh, throughout the eastern U.S., um, is that essentially all of the earliest ones derive from Indian trails. And, and, and so that's kind of my general theme here, is that these all have much more ancient uh, roots than uh, were often were acknowledged at the time, back in the early uh, 19th century, by the Americans who were building roads. Uh, and then later on, we've kind of uh, sometimes lose track of that as well. So, so I'm going to do a big, broad overview here and mention Federal Road once in a while, but uh, kind of take a, a bigger picture. Uh, try this. Nothing's happening. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Neither one's responding. Is this the PDF version or what? I have to do it like that? Scroll it down. <laughs> All right. We'll do it that way. Um, okay, so uh, just as, as a general uh, introduction to looking at places without any acknowledgement of Indian roads at all, uh, this is a really pretty amazing uh, early map uh, created by the Postal Service uh, in 1796 to show uh, postal roads in the eastern states. And you'll notice it's essentially blank west of the Appalachians at this point. Um, so uh, that's just one example of literally thousands of uh, early maps that don't um, have any kind of indication that there are roads at all or any kind of land routes. Uh, outside of what uh, Americans were building at the time. This is the follow-up map in 1812 by the same uh, cartographer for the same purpose. It's another post-road map. And uh, so he, I, mean, he, I guess to be fair to him, he was strictly focusing on where the mail routes went. And by this time we have the, um, um, the Federal Road I'm just defeated by technology today. Anyway, Federal Road running across uh, southern, uh, Alabama, uh, southwest, southeast corner of uh, Mississippi Territory, where Alabama is today. Um, all right, so coming up to uh, recent times, uh, if you look at most um, textbooks written maybe before 2000, uh, you're going to see uh, similar kinds of things created by historians. Uh, Helen Tanner uh, passed away some years ago, but she's a great friend of mine, so I don't mean to pick on her. She did actually more than anybody to uh, incorporate Indian pathways into um, uh, uh, kind of a modern historical uh, perspe geographical perspective of the U.S. But uh, in, her, in her, her various atlases that she produced, uh, she also used the same kind of trope that we see in the Bradley maps, uh, that it's essentially just uh, roads in the eastern states that are emphasized, her map of... The uh, first Europeans who came here as well kind of tended to ignore or, or not acknowledge uh, the Indian presence. And so when Hernando de Soto, during his uh, ramblings throughout the southeast, he was essentially lost um, the entire time. But he did have Indian guides who took him on paths. And so his whole route follows uh, Indian, uh, Indian pathways. This is, was not anything that the Spaniards blazed through the forest here. They were following pre-existing routes. And so even though this map doesn't show any routes whatsoever, and it's really quite uh, a useless map in trying to figure out where he went, uh, there have been huge efforts over the last 20-some years uh, by anthropologists and archaeologists to retrace uh, DeSoto's route. And today we have a pretty good idea where he went. And uh, uh, Robbie Etheridge in particular is really focused on what uh, the Spaniards on that expedition learned from um, Indian guides, the ones who were actually leading them through the woods, uh, and so we know that they were using uh, well-worn pathways uh, throughout the entire uh, southeast. You also notice in the, if I scroll this down a bit more here, this uh, uh, archaeological map, okay, thank you, 
um, shows where archaeologists have established where there were pretty major uh, political groups, big chiefdoms throughout the southeast at about the time, or a little bit after here on this, on this particular version of, uh, of DeSoto. And uh, so, in fact, what the route shows is that DeSoto hit almost all of those uh, because he was moving from one major political group, one major society to another. And uh, it was a really quite a thorough tour of the, the southeast that he undertook as he destroyed them at, on the, along the way. Um, okay, so here's a, um, just to try to begin to fill in the gaps here with uh, some Indian perspectives on the southeast uh, that, that are not reflected in many of the early maps uh, done by colonists. This is a, uh, a paper copy of a deerskin map that was presented to Governor Nicholson of South Carolina in 1721, and it's not clear from the caption who presented it, but we know from other documentation that it's from a uh, Catawba headman for people located in kind of western South Carolina. And uh, what that uh, what that headman drew was um, uh, Charleston on the left with the blocky street grid down there, uh, Virginia, another square chunk over on the right, and in between the, uh, the Catawba towns and some, some other important uh, peoples that the Catawba wanted to kind of emphasize their relationship with. And the way he did that was by drawing trails between the various political groupings. So the Cherokees and Creeks are shown there connected by trails to the Catawba towns. Um, there, there are actually several other examples along the same line. Uh, here's a couple from a more uh, French perspective. Um, Again, these things are traded for Europeans. They have a political agenda behind them, so they're not. Uh, and in fact, they don't look much like European maps because they're not really intended to be uh, route maps. They're intended to be statements of whatever you know, whatever position they're, they're being presented here. So, uh, two different kinds of maps. The one on the left is a real close, detailed view of the Chickasaw towns that the uh, French attacked uh, and failed to conquer uh, in the 1730s. And on the one on the right is the bigger view of the, um, uh, the various, uh, quite a number of different uh, Indian groups in the southeast. Uh, and the pathways leading from the Chickasaws in the center to the creeks and other groups around them are mostly interrupted. Uh, and they use this, uh, this symbolism, I think they call these the red paths of war that had been interrupted for peaceful uh, interchange and, and uh, interaction between their neighbors, and they were asking the French to help intercede and create a more peaceful situation where those red paths could be made white again and become paths of peace. So uh, th these actually really emphasize the pathways that existed uh, in, in some of the more important ones. We actually know today what they're talking about, precisely where these things went. This is another one. This is really my, my favorite of all, the big Chickasaw map of 1723. It's one of the, another one of these Nicholson maps that was presented to the South Carolina uh, governor at the time. And uh, it's a ex really quite extraordinary map. It covers, uh, that, that's, that's New York State way in the far upper right. And uh, over on the left, it's the Northern Plains, Gulf Coast down here on the left, and St. Augustine somewhere on the right there. So essentially the entire almost the entire eastern half of, of North America, or of the U.S., rather. Um, and within that region, there he, he, the uh, Chickasaw had men depicted about 30 different uh, political groups. He tried to indicate sometimes, apparently, to the, uh, to the British who were their allies and who were not, who were French allies, who were English allies. Uh, and so the English copyists then made all kinds of notations on this to kind of indicate what the Chickasaw fellow was saying to Nicholson. Um, it also shows lots of paths, but it has other details as well that I wanted to uh, show you in terms of a kind of re-sketching here so you can see it better. This is my redrawing of it uh, and keyed out to the various uh, social groups that he was describing. And then here I've highlighted the uh, rivers as opposed to the paths. And I hope you can see that, the blue being the rivers. So it's about half of the major thoroughfares shown on this map are waterways and about half are terrestrial paths. And um, I think this is really an important point. When you look at a map of North America today, if you look at a, a map of the rivers, you're essentially looking at an Indian map of transportation routes across the entire continent. These, these haven't changed. Uh, to any large extent, they've been dammed up and diverted sometimes, but by and large, that map still 
applies as it did back hundreds or maybe even thousands of years ago. So I'll come back to that point in a, in a bit here, but I wanted to try to pr provide some balance here. At least in the southeast, uh, waterways are probably much more important than land paths uh, just because of all kinds of practical reasons. And uh, we're, in fact, I'm currently engaged in a project down in Gulf Shores to uh, investigate an ancient uh, canal, canoe canal, that was dug sometime around 8600. Uh, just a really a stunning, the unexpected find that, uh, again, emphasized to me at least that that's, that is a, a really significant part of, of communication back in, the, in previous years. These dugout canoes uh, have turned up quite often archaeologically. There are probably several hundred of them known throughout the East. Uh, and so I give you some ex little ex examples of uh, historical sketches and watercolors. This is uh, one I didn't know about until fairly recently. It's a Ozark, uh, I'm sorry, Arkansas uh, Indian, Quapa Indian canoe uh, in the 18, about 1820. There's the canoe fight going on in the lower right uh, up here in the Alabama River and so on. So there's um, um, lots of these known historically as well as archaeologically. They were the main means of, of moving about the landscape by water in uh, a good bit of the south. The birch bark canoes that are much more famous, uh, the birch trees that are suitable for that kind of canoe building are pretty much limited to the very northern, northeastern states in Canada. So that's that, that region. Uh, and they have great um, uh, benefits. They are much lighter in weight. You can't really pick up a dugout canoe with any ease uh, and portage it where you could do that with birch bark. So, so there are certain limitations that they had down here, but they also are very durable. Um, when I first arrived in, in Mobile about 30 years ago, uh, my uh, colleague at that time was Reed Stowe, and he told me uh, about this story that happened right after Hurricane Frederick in 1979. And, and actually, uh, hurricanes often will, uh, with all the turmoil they cause, they often bring uh, canoes to the, to the surface. They'll somehow appear at that point. And uh, he, he said two, two boys were out fishing or something on the Escatapa River, and they found a dugout canoe, and it was filled with mud, so they scraped up the mud, and they paddled it home. So it's, you know, this is like a 500-year-old canoe, and still works. So these things really are pretty, pretty durable. <laughs> All right, so we go back to uh, Helen Tanner, who uh, created this map for the uh, addition of Powhatan's mantle that I was involved with back in 1989, and she was trying to kind of restore Indian pathways to the prominence they should have in early American history. And so this was her effort to show the really the most important ones of all, as well as some uh, canoe routes. In fact, she was, uh, she went to school in, in Florida and she learned about, early on, about this uh, uh, group of p people from the Miami area who actually paddled a dugout canoe over to the Bahamas and apparently did it routinely, which is, just seems like a death-defying act to me. But uh, so, so there were some, there's some canoe aspects to this as well, but mostly what she was emphasizing here was land routes. And they're very extensive, and these are all, all, all very well-known uh, pathways that the early colonists used uh, extensively. If you look back before uh, Helen, uh, there is a period from about 1890 to 19, the 1920s, basically, where uh, studying Indian trails was very popular, uh, not by the most prominent historians, but by kind of the second tier. I don't know if who, how you would qualify them, but a lot of amateurs, actually, uh, who dabbled in history became very fascinated by trails, and so there's a lot of really useful information that was recorded at that time. And it's early enough that it precedes most of the modern road building that started pretty much in the 1920s. So, uh, so they actually could still see a lot of these early roads and trace them back very directly to their Indian uh, antecedents. So uh, one in particular is a uh, fellow, William uh, Meyer, uh, created this uh, really extraordinary document that was published by the Bureau of American Ethnology, the part of the Smithsonian at the time. And uh, he was one of the first to try to consolidate uh, the information that he had into this overall picture of what has uh, existed in the East. This is really very selective, and he uh, had much greater detail for a couple areas, uh, uh, particularly Tennessee, where, where he lived. <clears throat> as far as, um, I, I'll, I'll pursue that in another minute or so here. There's, a, there's a, actually a lot of historical information about uh, people moving along on paths, how they used paths for all their various different purposes, and we, I think maybe today, tend to focus too much on two aspects of, of path usage 
uh, by American Indians in the past, and one would be for hunting, one would be for trade, and in trade in particular, is be, the, the emphasis today is because that's often our kind of the, our our entree into uh, the historical literature that derives from the 18th and 19th uh, centuries and earlier times about uh, why the writers were actually recording this at all. They often had an economic a reason to do so. And uh, the economic reason kind of then also relates to the fact that a lot of the trade was based on exchange of deer skins and other kinds of, of hunting acquired uh, commodities. So, so those two things are, are, are most easily studied from the records, historical written records. Um, but we, we also know uh, from kind of reading between the lines, you, doing ethno-historical analysis, that there's a lot of other reasons people moved around. There were diplomatic missions between Indian groups that sometimes uh, recorded, often not, uh, by, uh, by European writers. Uh, just social visits, people were visiting relatives. A lot of the clans that existed throughout the East are found in adjacent societies, so you, you might not be actually related through marriage or any direct traceable means, but you'd be, a, uh, you'd be a member of a similar clan and another society, and you would have a social tie there that you could take advantage of if you decided to travel uh, to that other, to another town. So there's all kinds of reasons, actually, people moved around, and we know that through a few accidental mentions here and there by, by colonists that these things did happen pretty often. Uh, I might notice while we're here, too, that the um, this, this family walking along a bayou in Louisiana, uh, they're walking in single file. Uh, almost everybody who talks about the earliest trails uh, before horses and before wagons uh, mentions that these were, you could only walk them in single file. There's really not any way to have gangs walking across, you know, five abreast down the trail. It just wouldn't work. They're very narrow. Uh, in the south, uh, Bartram in particular, and several people mentioned how they had to be narrow because if you tried to open up a wide path, you would get all this secondary growth forming in there and it would actually clog up with vegetation. And uh, Raven and I have surveyed through lots of woods in the, the southeast and we know that secondary vegetation is horrible and if you want to try to avoid that kind of growth if you have a, if you have a path uh, through running, running through the woods. Uh, there's one great account of, um, of a, a Moravian missionary, uh, Heckvelder, up in the, the northeast where he in the, kind of the Ohio country where he talks about actually having to crawl through the woods, and we can relate to that as well. But sometimes the, the overgrowth is so dense that really that's the only way you can get along a path. So, so these things were often very narrow and difficult to to, um, uh, to navigate, and to uh, people constantly get lost trying to follow these Indian paths. They're they're very small, narrow kinds of things cutting through the woods. All right. Um, so to try to um, um, reincorporate uh, American Indian uh, historical geography into the overall colonial picture. A lot of uh, historians and archaeologists have worked together over the years to try to do that in various parts of the southeast. And Kath Catherine and uh, Sarah Maddox and I worked on this map uh, for archives. It's in the main exhibit here, uh, trying to basically, basically convert a few British maps that were done in the years before the American Revolution that did show lots of pathways as well as town locations. So if, if, if Helen Tanner was around today, I think she would use this kind of map, if at all possible. So it not only would show the towns along the, uh, in the British colonies along the eastern seaboard and the major postal roads, but also the interior pathways and town locations. So this has really become the goal today uh, of uh, people using this geographical information to be balanced, to try to show the whole picture and not just big gaps where Indians existed. So that's the British period as best as we can tell. There is a comparable kind of composite uh, French view done in the 1730s. Both of these efforts were um, compilations of many different um, European colonist views of, of the landscape. And so in this case, this is uh, Baron de Cornet was the commander down in Mobile in the 1730s. He got reports from about a half a dozen different French map makers. And so you, um, you get this composite, which is very uneven in its quality, so that the Chickasaw Chocta towns are shown in great detail. Uh, some of the lower creek towns, but then upper creek towns are hardly shown at all. And, uh, but, and the rivers are shown in great detail in, in some parts, like the Alabama River, with all its little bends and wiggles. 
look on the further up north in the Coos and Talapoos are just straight lines. So, um, so they're clearly not uh, consistently high quality maps, but they do show, there are efforts to show the entire region uh, from a, a, a more balanced perspective than we often see today. So there's a blow up view of the uh, area, kind of the upper Alabama River with uh, Fort Toulouse shown up in the upper right. Uh, and great detail of, of Indian towns and paths throughout that region. The, um, the red line just to the east of the Alabama River, kind of running through the middle of the map, is uh, the location later on of the, of the Federal Road from Montgomery to, to the area just north of Mobile. And there it shows more, more of that. In detail, this is the same road that Bartram traveled uh, in 1775, and, and it, it, it's, it's very ancient, apparently. Um, yeah, the, the French, of course, because they're showing all this detail along the river, uh, they, they did that because they were actually moving most of their men and materials up and down the river to Fort Toulouse uh, by boat. And they got to know it very well. They had uh, Indian rowers. In fact, Mobile Indians uh, primarily were the rowers for the French during that period. And they would apparently name the bluffs as they went along. So the names on here are in Choctaw uh, languages, uh, or, or various Muscogean languages, mostly Choctaw. Um, and so a lot of the information that's shown here is coming from Indians as well. It's not just the French view of things at all. All right, so, so here's the, the Federal Road. I wanted to, I guess, uh, just mention this one more time that, that uh, my, my perspective here today is to look at the Indian origins of these roads, which uh, we, we've done throughout uh, our reports, and then this forthcoming book mentions that occasionally as well. But you could apply the same kind of study to all sorts of other uh, roads throughout the East. Here's an early uh, article by William, uh, by Peter Brannan, one of the, eventually became uh, one of the directors here at Archives, and uh, he wrote all kinds of little articles about roadways. Uh, he, he was traveling around these, this region in uh, an old Model A, I believe, and, and uh, uh, got stuck many times, all kinds of great photographs in the collections here of archives of Peter Brannan and his friends being stuck in the mud at various part, parts of the, the, sta the state. Uh, so, but he, so he knew these, place, these places intimately and uh, did learn a lot about the earliest history of these roads. Um, kind of contemporary with him were other efforts throughout the, the East, and in particular, Indiana has uh, a lot of interesting documentation about uh, early roads, and they um, tend to emphasize the, the buffalo traces that uh, these paths followed. And that kind of uh, um, brought back a memory from my childhood of reading about early roads and how uh, back in the 60s, I guess, 50s and 60s, uh, historians at that time were, were still talking about how the first, pe the first um, roads were actually built by animals and then Indians followed and then colonists came after them. And so that's the sequence that they often imagined took place uh, in the construction of roads throughout the, the East. And um, that was still in, in, in that, that apparently actually derives from this era, this early uh, 20th century era of studying early roads and the impact that certain roads had on the kind of overall people's views of, of ancient roads, particularly in Kentucky and Indiana where there are well-documented buffalo traces and the reason they're important there is because that's where salt licks were located. So if you actually plotted out the buffalo paths, they would convert, they kind of radiate out from salt licks. And that would be useful for some purposes for humans, whether Indians or, or later people, uh, because salt was an important trade item we know well into, the, into prehistory. Um, but buffalo didn't always go where you would want to go. I mean, that's not going to get you everywhere you need to be if you're just following buffalo paths. And I guess it should be self-evident today, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have made that impact back in the 1920s. Everybody's constantly talking in, in literature about buffalo paths. Um, you know, most paths on these maps that I've shown you already here, the, the few Indian paths, they go from Indian community to Indian community, and that's where that's where people want to go, you know, that's, and, and occasionally they would go to natural resources along the way, but mostly it's to other communities. So they had to create their own path system. That's a buffalo wallow, by the way, that was recorded historically and still around in 1910 or so. 
So today, if you go to Kentucky, you can still see advertising that refers to the Buffalo Trace. It's really heavily ingrained into Kentucky history, apparently. And um, so, uh, so I was just kind of intrigued by that. Um, there's no real evidence we had any buffalo down here in the south, in, in, from Montgomery South anyway, so the, the roads down here, you can't really attribute them to, to bison. Um, one early writer, this fellow uh, Archer Hulbert, uh, really did some excellent work, I think, in, in trying to understand uh, the nature of paths uh, uh, made by uh, Native Americans and, and also uh, how travel actually worked on them. And so he wrote, uh, in particular, I'd recommend if you ever want to pursue this, uh, would be this, the book on the right there, the Indian Thoroughfares book, uh, which I don't think has ever been reprinted, but it's, uh, it's really quite well done if you ignore all the racist uh, kind of asides that he has throughout. His, his thoughts about Indians are not very advanced, but certainly the uh, work on his on pathways was, was interesting. And so he uh, discusses all kinds of, of myths, now, not only the bison myth, but uh, other, other things as well, particularly trail markers. Uh, apparently up in the north, uh, northern part of the, of the U.S. in uh, New York State in that region, there are, were, were piles of rocks, just stacks of rocks some, directed sometime in the 19th century. And the notion uh, became uh, fairly common knowledge that these were Indian trail markers. Uh, just as in the south, we see these things indicated, these kind of bent trees uh, said to be trail markers. Uh, he very effectively disputed the uh, thought that the stones were uh, markers. There's really no uh, historical confirmation of that at all in the literature. Uh, just as there is no mention of anything like these bent trees in historical documents of the time. Uh, and if you, I mean, it's really, these are really simple to, to test. If you really think these things were bent into shape to mark an Indian trail, you just simply take an increment borer and you get a little core out of the tree and you count the rings and you find that they're 50 years old. You know, they're, these are not ancient trees. Uh, and if they are, there, there would, be, would be very few of those around today. And yet you see thousands, millions of these kinds of trees in the woods. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And I guess that would mean to some people that Indian paths went everywhere. Well, you know, it's, it's just not, there, there's no relationship between the two. These are just naturally formed odd uh, trees. Um, also, he, uh, Halbert pointed out that uh, American Indians did not blaze trees. That was something that the uh, European road builders did. The, uh, Lieutenant Luckett, who built the Federal Road in 1811, they blazed trees with an axe. But uh, again, there's no historical evidence that uh, American Indians did that. Uh, all of, this, this, of the descriptions of Indian paths say how difficult they are to follow. They really depended on very intimate knowledge of the, of the route. You had to be on it several times to memorize it, essentially. And um, Hulbert points out also that in many parts of the East, the goal was not necessarily to follow a single footpath, but to simply get from one place to the other. So you would use landmarks of, the, of terrain. If it's big open country and a prairie, for example, there's no particular advantage to following a path that's muddy when you can walk on a, a grass that's just, you know, it's easier to get along on the grass next to it. So, so in many parts of, uh, of the Federal Road route as well as other path routes, these uh, pathways are kind of amorphous and they, they change location slightly through time and they don't have a set uh, location. It's made it challenging for us to survey the Federal Road because it does not follow a single narrow route. It actually did move through time for various reasons. All right. Another interesting thing that uh, uh, a lot of us have been aware of for some time is the use of these kinds of camp shelters, temporary shelters by uh, many, uh, probably all uh, American Indian groups in the East. Uh, very quickly built out of, of sticks and some, and usually uh, bark peeled off of certain trees. As quick shelters for, usually described as hunting camps, but they actually served all kinds of temporary purposes. And again, that missionary Heckevelder that I mentioned a while ago, he talks about uh, running to a whole bunch of these up around Niagara, uh, up in western New York, built uh, by American Indians primarily, but used by any, any travelers. And he, apparently this was a very heavily traveled route, so they tended to proliferate in this area. And he ended up with quite a number of shelters, which could be reused by anybody that came by. And he pointed out that these were generally built uh, in fairly open areas because you don't want to have a tree fall on you in the middle of the night, limbs coming down. Uh, so uh, open clearings were preferred for these sorts of things. They needed to have some grass for their horses if they were, if they were European uh, or colonial era uh, travelers. 
you'd have want some dry wood nearby. And uh, anyway, and finally, if you decided to reuse a shelter, you would go inside, and they're usually lined with bark on, underneath as well, kind of a floor of bark. And so you would pick up that bark and make sure there's no rattlesnakes under there before you start to bed down for the night. So there are some disadvantages maybe to using these, but also they're readily made, but then often used by later uh, people. So uh, this is something that I really wasn't, I don't think, thoroughly aware of, that how, how commonly these would have been seen along uh, all the major pathways. There are quite a number of these. This, that first one was a Yuji Can. This is a Shawnee version, much like the type that Heckevelder talked about, uh, kind of a lean-to. And there is an, a, another type, more conical, that uh, seems to have been used down in, in our region quite a bit by the Choctaws and, and creeks in, in Alabama and, and Florida, uh, sometimes with uh, more like tents than, than with depending on what was used, whether hides or bark used to cover them. Uh, a lot of uh, travelers, in fact, along the Federal Road as well as elsewhere, mistook these uh, kinds of, of structures as uh, as actual houses of Indians. And so they would, in a very demeaning way, describe the housing of the people they were looking at without realizing these are temporary campsites. Okay, so to wrap up here, we've got um, these conversion of these uh, pathways into roads. Uh, most famously by uh, people like Daniel Boone coming through the Cumberland Gap. This is a really iconic image of early America. Um, and this is when pathways are turned into wagon roads, essentially that we get the much more, um, much larger features across the landscape. Uh, essentially all of these that I'll show here, the Cumberland Road, the Great Wilderness Road, they're all, they all start as Indian paths. Um, here's a map of Kentucky just a little bit after uh, Boone's trek in the 1770s, and it's uh, the um, this is the uh, tr trail up the Boonesboro right here. So that's the Boone Trace, which is a real big deal still in Kentucky. And uh, there's quite a few books about these things as well. So they've kind of re resurgent in, in popularity. Um, if you go up in the Pennsylvania, Ohio region, Braddock's Road, Forbes Road, they're, they're built during the uh, French Indian War. These are all uh, built on Indian paths, as the road builders said at the time. It's kind of been forgotten since then. Back in the around the turn of the last century, there was, this, uh, as I said, great interest in early roads. And so there are actually quite a few uh, document, uh, photographic documentation of the roads that, as they existed at those times. And on and on. The, um, some folks up in North Alabama have been working a lot on uh, Cherokee paths in that region. And so if you look at through the, li through the literature, there are uh, reports on Indian trails in Missouri, Ohio, uh, around Chicago, uh, Connecticut, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, everywhere but Alabama. That's <laughs> puzzling. Uh, here's a nice map from uh, Myers' early work of 1928 on, on Tennessee paths. So um, unfortunately, nobody's really uh, done a comprehensive overview of the, of the pathways in Alabama. And I don't know that I'm volunteering for that, but I'd be glad to help somebody if they wanted to do that. Um, so anyway, here's Trail of Tears, uh, again, very extensive. And some of these, are, of course, are um, undergoing a lot of uh, research and interest because they have the potential, like the Trail of Tears, to become a national historic trail, uh, which really raises the prominence of these uh, immensely in the public eye and brings in a lot of money for trail markers and uh, studies of, of various sorts. So uh, that, I think, was always the hope with the, uh, with the Federal Road. Uh, that it could be some kind of a, of a of a driving trail, which is our you know that's our best effort on the guide that's coming out here. But uh, more could be done certainly along those lines. All right, um, one last thing here. I wanted to just show a couple of maps from my area down in, or for, I guess I, from 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 Montgomery to Mobile. Really, uh, this is a um, Library of Congress uh, 1802 map. On the left is the the whole thing. It shows the Tennessee and Tom Bigby, uh, Tom Bigby uh, Forks region north of Mobile, kind of where the Tensaw, Mobile Tensaw Delta is. And on either side of the swamps uh, were lots and lots of early um, uh, uh, settlements. 
uh, which were mapped up, mapped out in pretty good detail here. Uh, the, the, the map has some, some real problems kind of cartographically, but you can pretty well figure out where, where people were located, little red dots or individual houses. And um, what I found interesting was there's not a single road shown on except in the way far west, northwest corner. Not, nowhere where any of the houses are shown or have any paths whatsoever. Uh, just kind of reemphasizing the importance of the waterways uh, to the uh, to settlers at that period. Uh, then, then there are these general land office township plats, which are really fantastic um, uh, resources. Uh, if, if, you, if I were to go about trying to plot the early paths and roads of Alabama, this is where I would start. Um, because a great many of them do show uh, roads. Uh, this is the one we've used repeatedly here at, in the Pentlala area, showing Manax. Uh, uh, store, whatever he had, it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a puzzle actually what to call Manic's place, but he's, Samuel Manic was this uh, Creek Indian who um, um, helped the Americans during the uh, Creek and Indian War, uh, Creek um, War of 1813, 1814, and so he was given a reserve uh, to kind of encompass his um, house on the Federal Road, and so it allowed us to go directly to that spot. And unfortunately for us, there's a modern house sitting right on top of his house, but uh, it, it did give us the access to the, to the, to the property. And uh, Gary Burton helped, uh, helped us with this uh, project to actually excavate around there and confirm that that's where Mannix house uh, stood. So uh, it not only shows the Ferrell Road, it shows other features around, and that's true of, of many of these plats. Uh, here are a couple of other random ones showing roads to so the Watumkee town, the Indian town by that name, the Kailiji uh, path, um, and various other ones that kind of in the, that's again, Watumka Road there to Talladega. And uh, this one shows uh, not only a path, it's unnamed on this particular plat, there's one that runs right through the middle, east to west, and then uh, on the north, Edge as an old field. Uh, a lot of Indian fields are shown as abandoned uh, on this, which would be a, a draw for prospective buyers uh, after removal. And then one last one here, kind of similar along similar lines, showing the prairie region um, somewhere in the Cahaba area, and then Indian Indian fields up on the upper upper edge there. So a lot of potential for uh, more research on this topic in Alabama. Thank you. Thank you.